around the world, economies are electrifying. But here in Canada, that's not how we see it. That's not how we talk about energy. We talk about electricity primarily in terms of supply. That is renewables, wind and solar and batteries. And we could talk about the big fight in, in Alberta, where essentially the Premier Daniel Smith and the United Conservative Party are waging a war against renewables and the power grid. And we've seen uh, a backlash against renewables in Ontario. And we've, I mean, the conversation uh, in Canada is usually around that and around the need to add renewables uh, to lower emissions. I mean, since ever since the uh, Trudeau government was elected uh, in uh, the fall of 2015, for the last 10 years, basically it's all been about climate policy and we rarely talk about the economic benefits of electrifying demand. And that's what's going on in other countries. They're electrifying their transportation. They're electrifying their, their buildings with heat pumps. They're beginning to electrify industrial processes like green steel. And that's what I want to talk about today is we need to change the way we talk about this. We don't, we, we want to electrify uh, and we already have an 84% clean energy grid, thanks to hydro and nuclear and, and some wind and solar. That's got to grow. And we're talking about building a national power grid, but it's not about the supply of electricity. That doesn't create jobs. That doesn't attract investment. It's the demand side where you're, man you're de manufacturing and deploying other technologies like EVs. So I want to talk about this in uh, personal context. Uh, about three years ago, almost well, three and a half years ago, uh, our little 1,300 square foot bungalow, the natural gas furnace, gave out. So we replaced it with a heat pump. And the cost to replace the natural gas furnace with and including an air conditioner was about $9,000. And the cost to put in a heat pump was about 13,000, might've been 12,000, somewhere in there. Uh, so it was a little bit more expensive on the purchase side, but I'll tell you, I don't regret that uh, for a moment. And one of the reasons is because our uh, house is so much more comfortable. We now have air conditioning in the summer, the, in the winter time, uh, instead of getting you know, gusts of hot air occasionally. Uh, the house is just comfortable all the time. I can't say enough good things uh, about this heat pump. And it's cheap, incredibly cheap. So our electric bills uh, are in the, uh, heat, you know, the middle of summer when it's hot and in the middle of winter when it's cold are about $125 a month. On the shoulder seasons where it's a little more temperate, it's about $75 a month. That's our entire energy bill for the house. And keep in mind that we, we uh, have, you know, energy media, we work out of a home office. So we have all sorts of devices going. We have editing computers and, and uh, you know, TVs going with news on them, et cetera, et cetera. Our entire bill is $75 to $125 a month. That's how inexpensive, low cost it is to have an electric house. Um, so I want to talk about, uh, but that's it's not the heat pump, um, hot water tank. Two years ago, repl replaced the natural gas one. It costs us the same amount as it would a natural gas. The, the cost to heat, like the, the operating costs, are about the same. So it's kind of a wash there. Uh, kitchen appliances, of course, all electric, you know, stove and fridge. It's, that's uh, not unusual. But then we bought an electric lawnmower because some neighbors uh, had one and they highly recommended it. We love ours. It's great. Don't have to keep gas on the premises. Love that. Um, even a leaf blower is electric. My e-bike, we have two e-bikes in the garage. I ride about 20 kilometers a day. And actually that replaces some of the, the miles that I, I used to drive. And I get exercise. It's, it's can't love my, my e-bike. So where we've arrived, quite unintentionally, you know, it's not like we set out and we said, we're going to, to build or rent a, we're going to change our home and make it electric. We're going to have a smart home. We're going to no, it just kind of crept up on us because every time we went to buy a, something that we needed or replace something, it was just better. And it was a little higher cost to purchase, but, but big improvement in performance and operating costs were that much lower. And that's why, that's why you see these kinds of technologies being rolled out in a huge way in China, but also in other, in other Asian countries, in Europe, they're being rolled out as well. It's on the demand side because somebody has to 
make those technologies. So there's a lot of R&D associated with it. There's installation associated with it. Uh, and so there's a huge opportunity on the demand side that here in Canada, we almost ignore. And we should stop doing that. So when, right now we're having a debate about the EV mandate. You know, should we get rid of it? We're asking the wrong question. Keep it, get rid of it, wrong question. The question should be, if we electrify our transportation fleet, how do we turn that into a competitive advantage so we lower our costs and make our, say, natural resource exports and other exports more competitive? How do we make our economy more competitive? How do we raise, keep, you know, maintain our uh, high standard of living, pay for the public services? That's why we should electrify, is because electric technologies are at least the same, uh, same cost uh, as uh, as uh, fossil fuel technologies, and in many, many cases lower, and they're continuing to fall. This is not something new. Uh, this is going to continue probably for another decade or two. So um, the only thing we haven't electrified is transportation. We have two vehicles in the driveway. They're a little older, um, Toyota and Infiniti. They're going to go forever. We just don't drive as much anymore. And so the, the cost for us is so low to keep those two vehicles that we said, you know what, we're going to wait. Maybe we'll wait three to five years until there's some better technology, like, you know, megawatt charging. So uh, maybe uh, autonomous driving, maybe that kind of thing that will suit us better uh, given our circumstances. So, but that's coming and we will be a 100% electric household. But it's not just on the household side. Not just, it's not just for, for consumers like you and I. It's also in the industrial sector. Now we're seeing in China, for example, I did a video uh, three, four months ago about how China is electrifying its construction equipment. So you've got a backhoe, uh, you've got a whatever, uh, you know, a dump truck, um, you name it. Delivery vans everywhere are being electrified. Um, buses, transit. Being uh, buses are being are are electrified, so the uh, the and then the industry. The reason this is significant is because it wasn't that long ago uh, where I would do interview people like uh, Professor David Lazell from the University of Calgary, and he said, "Look, thirty percent of primary energy demand by twenty fifty is going to be hydrogen, because we can't the electric technology won't work. It won't work in steel." It won't work in some of these other high temperature applications, and they're more you know difficult to to electrify marine transports, uh, aviation, and so on. But the thing is that in that short period of time, the costs have come down, the energy density of batteries has, has gone up. There have been so many innovations that that um, uh, industrial industry that we once thought would be difficult to abate, we're now switching to electricity. So the point I want to make here is that when we talk about an electric economy, we talk about the power grid, national power grid that Prime Minister Mark Carney wants to build. We should be talking about how we can electrify the economy at the same time. Like, why are you building a national power grid? It's because you want to expand the grid, you want to make it more stable, and you want to bring down costs so that, so that uh, we may get competitive or maintain our competitiveness, the one thing you can do in addition to that is really focus in on electrifying the rest of the economy that's still using oil and gas. We don't use any coal here in Canada, or very little of it. And so it's mainly the oil and gas side. Now that's gonna have howls of protest from Alberta, but here's a good example. There are things you can do with oil and gas, particularly bitumen from the oil sands, where you can turn them into materials. And I'll be having some interviews with uh, Sabic, the big uh, Saudi Arabia chemicals producer. It's one of the biggest in the world. They are all in on turning their hydrocarbon resources into materials instead of fuels. That's the way of the future. So we're having, you know, 2015 discussions about energy in Canada instead of 2025 discussions. And we, in order to sort of update our conversation, we need to start talking about electri electrifying demand to make us more competitive.